before I get back into it, I want to just put a plug for a book. I'm not getting paid by them, but um, Netter's Anatomy Coloring Book, I find it to be one of the best study sources for anatomy and physiology. It has sections on all the different organ systems. It has what to color and how to color it, really good pictures like from the Netter Atlas itself, and then review questions at the end of each chapter. There's also an online like accompaniment that you can get that has additional review questions. So if anatomy is the area you struggled in, or if you have a hard time studying anatomy, let's say you're not a strong flashcard person um, or you don't enjoy them, this can be a great resource. Um, I often color these just for fun when I review these for this class, but it's a great book, has a lot of good resources. So again, Netter's Anatomy Coloring Book has a digital inversion as well, but you could probably find um, an older copy and it'd be just fine. It just wouldn't have the digital atlas, but the coloring book is really what you're going for. This is the third edition, the one that I have, um, but it's it's quite good. All right. So I'm recording again. I'm going to share my screen. I heard for at least one student who was trying to get on who lost power. So we will continue to record all of these pieces. Um, all right. And we have snow now, so I'm excited. So moving down lower, so we talked about upper extremity. We're going to focus again on some of the high yield components from the lower extremity. So I'm not going to go through every piece of the lower extremity, pelvic hip or girdle, but I do want to touch on a few high points. Um, our sacroiliac joint is the first joint we encounter. It's actually, a, why it's interesting is because it's a combo of two different types of joints, a synovial joint anterior inferiorly and a syndesmosis joint posterior and superiorly. Um, the articular surface also is relatively irregular um, and kind of unusual for what a synovial joint structure would have. Uh, therefore, there's very limited motion, as we know, in our sacroiliac joint. But it has those kind of two joint regions, which make it um, a unique component, sacroiliac. Our ligaments, uh, these are these are where we could see more test questions. There's a ventral and dorsal sacroiliac ligament. Um, these are just thickened regions of our joint capsule. Uh, and we'll also see this iliolumbar ligament from the iliac crest to the transverse process of lumbar five. The goal of all of these is just limiting motion, right? I don't see tend to see a lot of questions come off of our sacroiliac ligaments. The bones of the lower leg, um, our patella, our tibia, our fibula. Uh, the patella is the most interesting just because it's, you know, with at, within an actual tendon, it's a sesamoid bone. Um, it's a large sesamoid bone. The tibia is weight bearing. The fibula is non-weight bearing. That's where I see the most questions asked about um, the lower extremity bone wise. Also the tibia will create our medial malleolus. The fibula will create our lateral malleolus. And our inter interosseous membrane is what's connecting the two, much like the radius and the ulna in the um, forearm. Looking at our tarsus, there's seven bones in the tarsus region. Um, so if we look superior and then clockwise on the right foot, we can see we are going to start with um, our talus. Let me try to get my pointer so we can see. So our talus here, then our calcaneus here, our navicular let it go there, um, our medial cuneiform, our intermediate cuneiform, our lateral cuneiform, and then cuboid. So moving superior and then clockwise. So again, we have in this picture, I don't know if you can see, yeah, you can see talus, calcaneus, navicular, and then this is showing our cuneiforms. Um, you can't see the medial one in this image, just the, in, the um, intermediate and lateral, and then cuboid. Then obviously you have your metatarsals and phalanges. So again, like the wrist bones, this could be a region where there could be some test questions. Um, a good kind of connector point for you to note is the only bone of the tarsus region that articulates with the leg bones is the talus. Uh, so if asked about um, bearing weight, the talus is the only one that's articulating with our leg bones. The calcaneus, though, is transmitting the majority of body weight from the talus to the ground. So talus connecting to tibia, bearing that weight. And then calcaneus is taking that talus weight and pushing it into the ground. So kind of transmitting that into the ground. Um, navicular has a tuberosity of the navicular, which can press against the medial part of your shoe, causing pain. Um, the tuberosity of the cuboid is a groove for the fibularis longus muscle tendon. 
Um, those are probably the most interesting port pieces about these bony structures. We'll talk about Tom, Dick, and Harry and their relationship um, with these structures a little bit later. Looking at our venous drainage of the lower extremity, it's drained by superficial and de deep veins. Um, superficial veins are found in our sub Q tissue. They have some valves, but not as many. So they're more likely to form varicose veins. Deep veins are deep to deep fascia. They travel with the arteries and they're less likely to form varicose veins. Um, the two major superficial are the great and small saphenous veins. Um, we can see in this picture our great saphenous vein and our small saphenous vein. Um, we can also, a couple other important veins would be our dorsal digital vein of the great toe, which we can view here. The dorsal venous arch of the foot, which we can see here. Um, are kind of the last kind of most distal points from our great saphenous vein. And then this great saphenous vein empties up into our femoral vein up top. So we can kind of see this, this travel connection all the way down. The small saphenous vein is going to arise on the lateral side of the foot from the fifth dorsal digital vein of the fifth digit. So we can kind of see fifth digit. This is where we're going to see origination. Um, moving up the dorsal venous arch, it's going to move between the heads of the gastroc and it'll empty into the popliteal vein up top here in that behind the knee region. Okay. Now the Is deep veins. So those I those were our sorry, superficial veins. Show. Oh no, you're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up? Um, would that be located posterior to the lateral malleolus, like in reference for like a bony landmark if they ask something like that? Posterior to lateral malleolus, yes. This would be located typically posterior to lateral malleolus. And again, we're not going to feel a pulse because there's no, right. uh, it's not arterial, it's venous structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good question. So those were our superficial veins. So really just two major ones to know. Great saphenous is going to empty into femoral. Small saphenous, which is posterior, is going to empty into popliteal. Um when we look then at the deep veins, our deep veins, we can associate, again, traveling with our arteries, hijacking that arterial uh, pulse for both warming as well as for moving up um, back into our systemic circulation. Um, so our VNA combatants, they follow our deep arteries. Um, they don't occur as single veins in the limbs. Um, the deep veins are typically paired. Uh, they're actually, there's like a full connective tissue sheath that covers them and allows for the pulsations of the artery to move those veins up. This is going to be 90% of your venous return from lower extremities is via these vena com comatants. Um, all the deep leg veins are draining into our popliteal vein. Um, and if we're then thinking about DVT, where do the majority of our DVTs come? Are they going to come from deep or superficial veins? Superficial? No, deep. Right. In the name, it tells it to <laughs> yeah. you. But we, but we question ourselves because we're like, oh, it has to be the ones that we know the names for. It's actually going to be from our deep veins, right? Deep vein thrombosis. So when we're dealing with a question about DVT, oftentimes the, the vein itself won't necessarily have a specified, a specified name because it's part of this vena combatants. Um, it, it's could, if it does have a specialized name, it's coming from the specific actual, the vein that follows along with the artery. So anterior tibial vein, fibular vein, et cetera. But a lot of times we're just seeing it's part of these deep vein comatants that these DVTs are coming from. Excellent. But we question ourselves. This is probably the most common board question I see get wrong is people get pulled to say like posterior, like this small saphenous or great saphenous vein, when in fact it's not, it's our deep veins. Okay. So now we're moving a little bit out of venous drainage and we're gonna move into um, some of the compartments of the thigh, the anterior compartment of the thigh and the posterior compartment of the thigh. Um, think about your anterior compartment of your thigh like the posterior compartment of your arm and the posterior compartment of your thigh like the anterior compartment of your arm. Because we remember, so anterior portion of our arm is helping us do what? It's helping us do flexion versus the posterior compartment of your thigh is also helping you do flexion. Right, so you can see kind of how we're gonna be able to compare these two regions. So when looking at the thigh, this is like we like sliced across the middle of our, our thigh here for patient. 
Um, here's our femur. Femur, we can see that shaft. Um, we're probably right in the middle and we see this actual medullary cavity. Um, our anterior compartment muscles of the thigh are flexing the femur at the hip and they're extending the leg at the knee versus the posterior compartment of the thigh are flexing um, the knee and they're extending the thigh, right? Because a lot of these muscles cross over at the hip. And then all of your medial compartment muscles here are going to adduct the thigh. So looking at our anterior compartment, this compartment up top, um, it's going to contain our flexors of the hip and extensors of the knee, all innervated by our femoral nerve. So we have our femoral pulse, our femoral nerve. It's going to innervate all the anterior compartment muscles. So our pectinus, our iliopsoas, our sartorius, and all four quadriceps muscles, rectus femoris, lateralis, intermediates, and vastus medialis. A key piece here, all the anterior compartment femoral nerve. Our action of all the anterior compartments is going to be hip flexion and knee extension. So looking at the pectineus, um, we can see it's coming off of the pubis to the lesser trochanter. Uh, we can kind of look at the actions. We know in general what the actions are. This one adds the medial rotation due to its attachment points. Our iliopsoas, we really think about this as like that deep, deep muscle that oftentimes can get like irritated. But one piece I want you to keep in mind with this muscle is this is the chief flexor of the thigh. So at the hip, this is your main flexor. Um, it also is a huge postural muscle that's helping you stand and maintaining your normal lumbar curve. Um, the, it's also inserting on your lesser trochanter. Your sartorius, your thin muscle that's kind of crossing across your thigh, it is um, starting at your ASIS, your anterior superior or your iliac spine. Yep, anterior superior iliac spine. Uh, it's inserting all the way on the pes anserine, the medial surface of your upper tibia. And again, it's, you know, femoral innervation. But one piece it does is it brings your leg into the cross-legged sitting position. So that's its, that's its motion. It's lateral rotation and flexion, but it's very weak. So it's only acting really as a synergist because it's a very thin muscle. Now our quadriceps femoris muscle, we can start with our rectus femoris. This is coming from our anterior inferior iliac spine, our AIIS, different than ASIS. And it's going to the tibial tuberosity. And it actually is going to connect directly with our patellar ligament. Um, the patellar ligament, where the patella is, is part of the quadriceps femoris. And so this is flexion and extension, flexion of thigh, extension of knee. Our vastus medialis, um, it's going to be part of our quad femoris muscle on the medial side. Um, we'll see its insertion is also going to be tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament, and it's going to be extending the leg of the knee. We can see then our vastus lateralis here. Um, this is going to insert onto the tibial tuberosity via patellar ligament, extension at the knee. And then lastly, our vastus intermedius. This is going to be under that rectus femoris muscle. So it's going to be more deep. And it's also inserting all onto the tibial tuberosity extension of like at knee. So your all your quad femoris muscles have the same insertion, same action, and same innervation. Our medial compartment muscles um, are collectively called the adductor group. So adding things back together, pulling the leg inward, and they're all innervated by your obturator nerve ob with an OB, obturator nerve. So this medial compartment muscles include our gracilis, the thin muscle here, our abductor longus, abductor brevis, and abductor magnus. Abductor magnus being the one that's doing the majority of the work. The gracilis is the only one that crosses the knee of this group and the hip joint. It's coming off of the pubis all the way to the pes and serene. Obturator nerve, it's going to um, adduct the femur and flex the leg. Our adductor longus is the most anterior muscle in the group. We can see this here, adductor longus. And then the adductor brevis, um, we can see is deep to the pectineus and the abductor longus. So it's kind of it's kind of hiding beneath the adductor longus. They all are coming off the pubis. Um, they're kind of attaching to this linea aspera on the, on the femur, all obturator nerve and adduction and flexion of femur. A little moment for the adductor longus on its own, just so we can really see it. Adductor brevis on its own, so we can see it. This is deep to our adductor longus. 
And then our adductor magnus, this is like the big one coming off of the ischium as well as the pubis. Um, oh, there we go. And it's innervated by the obturator and the sciatic nerve. So this is the only one that has additional innervation of this medial group. Um, and it's going to do extension and adduction because it's located more posteriorly. So when it contracts and shortens, it's actually going to extend the hip at the thigh. Adductor magnus. So that's our medial group. Now, our uh, if we we're looking at uh, this kind of structure, specialized structure, we had some triangles up top, kind of by the clavicle, by the neck. Here's another one that's down lower, um, actually by the lower extremity. So we have our femoral triangle. This is another one that I would encourage like learning. There's a lot of different um, mnemonics you could use. But if we go lateral to medial and follow our structures, we're going to have our femoral nerve, our femoral artery, a femoral vein, and then an empty space bigger than females, and then our lymphatic structures, which are not viewed in this picture. We can see that it's bordered by the sartorius, the adductor longus, and then our inguinal ligament. So those are the structures that make it. So inguinal ligament superiorly, our sartorius, I guess, laterally, and then our adductor longus medially. But we go nerve, artery, vein, space, lymphatics. That would be our order. It's even showing you a few pieces coming off here of this vein. We have the external pudendal vein, and then we have our great saphenous vein coming off of this femoral vein. So we can see kind of that drainage pattern. Can you help to orient where like Hesselbach's triangle and like inguinal hernios would occur just like so that I can put them together, please? Yes. So we, I do think I have um, in our, like a repro section, a whole thing about Hesselbach's triangle and inguinal hernia, but because we don't have those structures here, it's kind of hard to visualize. Let me get a, let me pull up a picture at the end of this lecture and then we can see it together. Cause I think it'll be helpful if we overlay it. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. Awesome, yep, I will make sure I pull that up. Awesome. I talk about it in our path section, so uh, section four, but I think like weekend four, but I'll bring it up here today just so we can see it either before lunch or after. So then looking at our femoral artery. So again, this, I know these are like tiny itty bitty, itty bitty pictures, but um, if we zoomed in here, this is at the abdominal aorta, then our external iliac artery, internal iliac artery, and then moving down, we get to our femoral artery kind of passing through that triangle. Um, the femoral artery is a deep artery of the thigh and it's the, the or that I guess it's, well, it's not considered necessarily a deep artery of the thigh, but it branches off to several different deep arteries of the thigh. And the deep one continued here is the left arterial profunda femoris. It's the largest branch of the femoral artery. And if we had to choose one artery, the profunda femoris would be the chief artery of the thigh. Profunda femoris gives off perforating arteries that kind of wrap around our femur and supply of ductum magnus, hamstring, and vastus lateralis. The circumflex femoral arteries are branches typically off the profunda. They could come off directly from the femoral artery. Each person has a slightly different branching pattern, but typically the circumflex comes off the profunda, which comes off the femoral. They're going to encircle the thigh and astomos with other arteries. The medial circumflex supplies the majority of blood to the head and neck of the femur. Um, so that's why we talk about that one potentially getting severed. We'll look at that picture here in a second. The, and then also um, the posterior retinacular arteries. And then the lateral circumflex passes laterally along the joint capsule and supplies the muscles on the lateral side of the thigh. So if we follow along again, we have, let's make our little line. We have our femoral artery, we have our profunda femoris, we have our circumflex femoral arteries, and then we'll have a medial, and then we'll have a lateral. So understanding femoral is coming, is going to be that big starter. We can actually assess that pulse in the triangle we just looked at. The profunda femoris is your chief artery of the thigh. It itself is going to um, give blood supply to the adductor magnus, hamstring, and vastus lateralis. Circumflex femoral is then going to separate into medial and lateral branches. Medial branch is blood to head and neck of femur. And then lateral is going to be across the joint capsule and supplying muscles all along the lateral portion of our thigh. So laterally out here. 
if we zoom into this, um, you can kind of see the relationship. So internal iliac, external iliac, femoral, profundus, femoris. And then we can see um, kind of these arteries coming back up here. It's super challenging to see. I mean, I think I have a better picture later. So we'll kind of come back to this blood supply, the ligaments and this area, because this is a challenging to read. Yeah, here we go. So looking at our lateral and medial femoral circumflex arteries, both of them can arise from our femoral or deep femoral, like I said, artery. The medial femoral circumflex artery is the most important artery because it supplies the majority of blood to the head, neck, and femur. So if you had a fracture of the head, neck, and femur, and you lost, you, you cut off that medial femoral circumflex artery supply, you could lead to ischemia and um, eventually necrosis after injury. So that's kind of the key kind of pathologic connection here with this structure. So this is our femoral head. This is that joint capsule. We have our medial circumflex artery coming off here. It's providing blood supply all throughout here. Our lateral circumflex artery is more the joint capsule space. But if we had a fracture and we severed and we lost communication, we lost blood supply from our medial circumflex, this portion here could undergo a vascular necrosis and die off the femoral head. That's your big danger. Looking at our muscles in the glute region, we have our gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus. So gluteus maximus, um, is going to be innervated by our inferior gluteal nerve, which comes off of L5, S1, and S2 nerve roots versus gluteus medius and minimus. Both get the innervation from the superior gluteal nerve, which is L5 and S1 nerve roots. So I think inferior, meaning that it goes more inferiorly, it assesses, it brings into S2 nerve root, superior, it's more superior, just S1. Um, if we look at actions, our gluteus max is going to be extension and lateral rotation. Our gluteus medius and minimus is going to be abduction, abduction, medial rotation, and then helping with gait or with stability in the body. And we can kind of see max, med, min. Um, max is obviously the most external or the most superficial, then medius, and then minimus connection point here to the muscles of the glute. Here's our sciatic nerve running through. And then we can see how some of these muscles, specifically the piriformis, are going to attach over it and could cause compression on that nerve. And that's the basis behind piriformis syndrome. The tensor fascia lata, the TFL, is a muscle and it's going to form um, the uh, IT band coming off of it. So its attachment point is at our ASIS and the anterior iliac crest. It forms the iliotibial tract, which is going to move all the way down and attach at the lateral condyle of the tibia. So it's that really like thin band on the lateral portion of your leg. It's also innervated by our superior gluteal nerve. And its primary goal is flexion of the thigh, but it has to act with other muscles typically. So it's um, working to get together in tandem with other muscles. Um, but IT um, issues can occur and they come off of that TFL muscle themselves. Our lateral rotators kind of up in this glute region include our obturator internus, our superior and inferior um, gemelli, and our quad femoris. Um, so these are going to be our lateral rotators, deep layer, smaller muscles. Um, they also can help with stabilization of the hip joint um, to help with stabilizing not just the, the joint itself, but the femoral head, maintaining that contact in the acetabulum. If we look at innervation here, we can see that the obturator internus has the nerve to the muscle itself, nerve to the obturator internus that comes off of L5 and S1. Uh, the superior and inferior gemelli are going to have the same nerve as above, as well as the quad femor femoris nerve. And then the quadratus femoris has literally the nerve to the quadratus femoris. All are coming off of the L5 S1 nerve roots. That's important to note. And so quadratus femoris being here, bloop. Um, let me see if I have our inferior gemellus being here, our superior gemellus being here, and our obturator internus being in the middle between the two. So if we went from top to bottom, we could say superior gemelli, obturator internus, inferior gemelli, and quadratic, quadratus femoris. Above all of them is the piriformis, and above those is going to be your glute muscles, your minimus, your medius, and your maximus covers them all. All right. 
Now a moment for the piriformis, the one we've all been waiting for. Um, so piriformis comes through here, attaches down to the greater trochanter, innervated by S1, S2 nerve roots, and its job is to abduct and laterally rotate the femur. So looking then at this posterior compartment, um, three of the four muscles in the posterior compartment of the thigh are going to be hamstring muscles. So we'll see um, kind of two big groups here, our semi muscles and our bicep femoris muscles. The bicep femoris muscles have a long and short head, and then the semi muscles have semimembranosis and semi tendinosis. When we look together, our bicep femoris two heads, they're both coming off, uh, well, the long head's coming off of our ischial tuberosity. Um, they're inserting on either lateral tibia or the head of the fibula. So short head, head of fibula, long head, lateral tibia. They're doing thigh extension and knee flexion, lateral rotation. Um, the short head's innervated by our sciatic nerve, and then the long head's innervated by the sciatic nerve, but it's the tibial nerve. It's a branch of the sciatic nerve. Our semitendinosis and semimembranosis, so we can see kind of these are going to have different structures, they'll have a little bit different feel. Um, they are both innervated by the tibial portion of the sciatic nerve. They're both extending the hip, um, and they're flexing and medially rotating the, the leg or the knee versus looking at the bicep femoris as the group. Um, it's going to be the common fibular portion of sciatic nerve for the short head, the tibial portion for the long head, and they're doing extension and lateral rotation. Again, another look at these muscles pulled out separately, just so you can see them separated, both innervated by the sciatic nerve, just if we look at it, um, the tibial portion of the sciatic nerve, and if we focus then and we look at, okay, well, what are these portions looking like at the posterior compartment as a whole? Um, this is just talking about these like nerves and the nerve branches that are located here. Not super helpful. All right. So then looking in this region here, the pes is the goose's foot. So this is like what's attaching at that pes and serene piece. From medial to lateral, we have our sartorius, the gracilis, and semitendinosis. So our sartorius tendon, our gracilis tendon, and our semitendinosis tendon make our pes and serene, or pes and serenus. So you could think about it as some goose talon, uh, some being sartorius, goose being gracilis, and uh, the T being the semitendinosis. That's your, how you get your T. But all of these attach is that pes and serene medially. Sartorius obviously crosses over, gracilis straight down, and semitendinosis coming from posterior compartment. So I've mentioned a lot about these different rami um, coming off of our lumbar and our sacral region. And so like we have the brachial plexus, we also have a sacral plexus, right? So when we look at L4, L5, and S1, 2, and 3, these together make up our sacral plexus. Um, the sciatic nerve is com coming off of here, and we from the sciatic nerve, we'll get our tibial nerve and our common fibular or our peroneal nerve. We'll also see the superior gluteal nerve and the inferior gluteal nerve kind of coming off of this region, but they are separate from our sciatic. The pudendal nerve coming off from nerve roots two, three, and four will innervate at the anal and urethral sphincters and external genitalia. You'll also have the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh, your nerve to quadratus femoris, and your nerve to obturator internus. So if we kind of follow along here, we can see um, what muscles are innervating where. So we can see superior gluteal nerve coming off here, coming off of this region up top, this region here, and this region here. So our L4, 5, and S1, innervating our TFL, our glute med and glute min, our inferior gluteal nerve, innervating our glute maximus, common fibular and tibular are both parts of our sciatic nerve, our obturator internus nerve, and our quadratus femoris nerve. I think this picture is easiest to see first, this picture with all these numbers is harder to look at. This kind of is like almost worse to view. Um, this one's okay, but I like this image as my starter pack for labeling the sacral plexus. All right. Another moment for another area. So the internal iliac artery, again, that artery kind of coming from our common iliac, we have our internal iliac and our external. So external iliac going here internal iliac going here. 
it's going to give rise to three branches that supply blood to the lower extremity, our obturator, our superior gluteal, and our inferior gluteal. The obturator artery um, will provide an artery to the head of the femur through the ligament of teres. The superior gluteal supplies our glute muscles, and the inferior gluteal, gluteal will send branches to the glute max and the muscles that attach to our ischial tuberosity. Another artery that we mention is the internal pudendal artery. This is going to enter through our perineum, through the lesser sciatic foramen. It does not supply the buttock. It's going to supply structures more internally. And again, this is that chief artery, that deep artery of the thigh. We mentioned this already, so I'm going to move kind of past this. This is just another picture if you're interested in doing some labeling to help you kind of understand where all these things are going to. Venous and lymphatic drainage of the gluteal region. So our veins of the gluteal region are um, tributaries of the internal iliac veins. Um, so superior and inferior gluteal veins will accompany the superior and inferior gluteal arteries. They're important um, because they communicate with femoral veins. And if there's a DVT of the femoral vein, they can help with shunting blood past that obstruction. Uh, our internal pudendal veins will accompany the arteries that are there and drain blood from the perineum into the internal iliac. Perforating veins allow for kind of anastomosis surrounding and they're communicating um, with uh, the perforating arteries draining into the deep veins of the thigh. Our lymph tissues are going to follow along with the lymph veins via gluteal lymph nodes. And then we can also see kind of the specific lymph nodes, specifically our inguinal lymph nodes that we often follow down and learn to palpate and repro. Moving downward into our popliteal fossa um, in this section here, we often, we obviously know about our popliteal artery. Um, it's a continuation of our femoral artery after it passes through the adductor hiatus region. Um, at the inferior border of the popliteal region, it's going to um, divide into our anterior and posterior posterior tibial arteries. So popliteal, both anterior and posterior tib arteries. Um, and then we have kind of five that are supplying the joint capsule as a whole, as superior lateral, medial, um, and genicular arteries. I wouldn't worry as much about these. I would mainly pay attention to your popliteal and anterior posterior tib for this region here behind the knee. Um, if you wanted to, you could kind of look at these five arteries and see like, oh, they're all innervating the joint or providing blood supply to the joint capsule here. This would be a lower yield portion of study. Nerves in this region, the sciatic nerve ends at the superior angle of the fossa. It'll then divide here into tibial and fibular nerves. The tibial nerve is a larger branch and it's going to branch off again into the soleus, gastrocnemius, and plantaris and popliteus muscles. Um, the sural nerve supplies more of the lateral portion of the leg and the ankle, and it's derived from the medial sural cutaneous nerve, which comes from the tibial nerve. Um, the common fibular nerve leaves the fossa and it's going to um, go kind of pass, passes over the posterior aspect of the head of the fibula. Uh, the common fibular nerve will um, wrap around the head of the fibula. And so it is a very common injury to the lower extremity. And it'll divide into two branches, superficial and deep fibular nerves. So these are your main kind of nerves of this region. So again, sciatic nerve breaking into tibial and fibular nerves. Tibial is a larger branch. It's going to come from, it's going to break down into the sural nerve. You'll have a medial sural cutaneous nerve that will go down to the ankle. Um, the common fibular nerve coming off of the fibular nerve will eventually break off into superficial and deep fibular nerves in this lower extremity space. Those would be your more high yield ones to know. So our posterior tibial artery, um, as we move off of kind of the, it can descend downward, it'll give off three branches that we often consider the tripod. The anterior tib, the fibular artery, and the posterior tib artery. The anterior tibial artery we can see here travels through a gap in our intraosseous membrane to supply the anterior compartment of the leg. The fibular artery, which we can see here, this region, is supplying our lateral compartment of the leg and the posterior tibial artery, which we can see here, is going to supply more of the medial portion of the leg and wrap around the medial malleolus. If we follow down to the, all the way down to the feet, we can see that eventually that fibular artery um, associated with the dorsalis pedis pulse that we can find on the top of our foot 
we can't see the posterior tibial artery kind of wrapping around, but we know that's where we take the pulse for the posterior tibial artery right next to our medial malleolus. We're just not able to really see it in this picture. So thinking about our pulse taking places. Looking then at the last portion of the lower extremity down into the compartments of the lower leg, we have our anterior group of muscles and then we'll have our posterior group of muscles and then we'll have a lateral group. So our anterior group of muscles, we have our tibialis anterior muscle. This is what we often associate as our shin muscle. Um, it's going to dorsiflex the foot and provide inversion. Again, inversion, remember when we are walking on the outer side of our foot, the deep fibular or the perineal nerve on the nerves is the nerve that innervates it, which is the nerve that innervates all these muscles in this group, as we will see deep fibular all the way down. So that's our tibialis anterior. Our extensor hallucis longus is going to extend the hallus and dorsiflex the foot along with the tibialis anterior, hallux being our big toe. Extensor digitorum longus is going to extend the lateral four toes and dorsiflex the foot. And lastly, our fibularis tertius is going to dorsiflex and do eversion of foot. So the opposite effect of the tibialis anterior, eversion walking on the middle side of your foot. Okay. An interesting attachment point to keep in mind is the fibularis tertius is going to come off and attach at the fifth meta um, metatarsal. Um, it's interesting because it is associated just with that fifth metatarsal bone. So if there was a fracture or damage to that bone, fibularis tertius could be the one that's involved. Looking at our lateral compartment of the leg, um, if we look at this as the everter compartment. Uh, we have our fibularis longus and our fibularis brevis. Uh, coming off of the upper versus the lower third of the fibula, fibularis longus attaching at the um, first uh, metatarsal and the medial cuneiform, fibularis brevis at the fifth metatarsal. Um, it's innervated by the superficial fibular nerve, which is the terminal branch of the common fibular nerve. Um, and then it's going to allow for eversion and plantar flexion, so pointing the toe down. We can kind of start to see, then we're going to be talking about kind of what's traveling along these sides of the ankle um, as we go across here. So we can see some of these different structures. We'll get to that in a moment. Looking at the posterior portion of the calf, we can see our gastrocnemius being the big muscle, the soleus, which kind of looks like a fillet of fish, and then the plantaris. Um, the, if we look at all three of these muscles in the posterior compartment, they're all three innervated by the tibial nerve, tibial, tibial, tibial. They're all going to have actions of the plantar flexing the foot. Um, plantaris is absent in about 5 to 10% of people and often can be used for reconstructive surgery because we don't have to have it. Gastroc is going to also provide some flaccid flexion to the knee because it will start from our femoral condyles above the knee and then we'll insert on the calcaneus via our Achilles tendon. Soleus will come off of the fibula and tibula. It'll insert onto the cal calcaneus as well. And it's going to help with standing. Um, it's not going to do anything to the knee whatsoever. It does not cross over the knee joint. The deep muscles of this group, um, we'll see they're acting on different regions. All three of them, again, here in this category are innervated by our tibial nerve. So our extensor hallucis longus is going to flex the big toe and plantar flex the foot. The flexor digitorum longus flexing all the toes besides the big toe and plantar flexing the foot. And the tibialis posterior allows some inversion as well as plantar flexion. So this is now where we get to Tom, Dick, and Harry. The ten tendons of the flexor hallucis and digitorum longus cross as they enter into the sole of the foot, the tibialis posterior has a large inserting tendon that inserts onto the tarsal bones. So this is your mnemonic to remember the order of the three tendons of the deep posterior muscles of the leg, posterior to the medial malleolus. So you have your tibialis posterior, your flexor digitorum longus, and your flexor hallucis longus. And we can see this here. So here's our medial malleolus. Here's our tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor hallucis longus, Tom, Dick, and Harry. Classic um, question on boards, knowing who these are, knowing where they go by, knowing their order. All innervated by the tibial nerve. Uh, combining kind of these different movements together, eversion versus inversion, our perineus, longus brevis, and tertius are going to help with eversion. 
And then the, our um, inversion muscles are the tibialis anterior and posterior. So this is the second letter rule. Everything that has a second letter of E, everts, second letter of I, inverts. Remember, eversion standing on the middle portion of your foot, inversion standing on the lateral portion of your foot. Looking then at our extensor digitorum brevis, hallucis brevis, and extensor hallucis brevis, um, we can see both are integrated by the deep fibular nerve. Um, the digitorum is extending the toes versus hallucis, again, big toe, big toe extension. Anytime digitorum, is, uh, assume it's like the digits and hallucis, assume it's the big toe. Our last little moment at the bottom of the foot, we have our medial and lateral plantar nerves. They're supplying these muscles of the foot. Um, we can look at them. I don't even think I have a great image here. Well, lateral plantar nerve here, medial plantar nerve here. There we go. So medial here, lateral here. I would know generally that they're supplying these intrinsic muscles of the foot. Um, you also have some intrinsic supply from our deep fibular nerve as well. Arteries of the foot, we've already traveled these down, but we have um, the anterior tibial artery becomes the dorsal artery of the foot or dorsalis pedis. Um, it will, then if we go down our deep plantar artery, it will dive and become the, and join up with our lateral plantar artery to form the deep plantar arch. And our arcuate artery gives off of kind of second, third, fourth dorsal metatarsal arteries. They'll actually move into the toes. But I think the biggest connector point is this one here, anterior tib becomes dorsalis pedis. Dorsalis pedis artery here, and then we have this, this arch that's gonna kind of combine the two. This is just another view looking at those smaller arteries, the smaller blanching arteries. They say this is lower yield overall. I'd pay attention to more of your bigger bang for your buck. A moment for our knee, we have our cruciate ligaments that cross during medial rotation of the tibia, our ligaments kind of wind around each other. They limit medial rotation. During lateral rotation, they unwind, allowing for a little bit more of uh, lateral rotation, even and more if the knee is flexed. Um, due to them moving in all the different directions, one of them will always be taut, even if the other is relaxed. Our anterior cruciate ligament is the weaker ligament. It goes from the anterior tibia to the inner surface of the lateral femoral condyle. It will limit hyperextension of the knee and posterior displacement of the femur on the tibia. So of, of essentially avoiding our knee from straightening too much. Our posterior cruciate ligament is posterior tibia to the inner surface of the medial femoral condyle, and it's preventing the opposite direction, anterior displacement of the femur. So we can see our anterior cruciate ligament here in this portion, and then our posterior cruciate ligament here, this portion. Uh, anterior cruciate ligament here, posterior cruciate ligament here. And this is our patella, just to orient us. This is our anterior view. This is our posterior view. This is like if we chopped the patella tendon and we moved it up out of the way. So it's normally would be attached here. At the ankle, um, sprained ankles or ankle um, sprains are important. So that's why we care about knowing these ligaments. Uh, the deltoid ligament is going to be at your median ankle. It'll extend from the medial malleoli, navicular, calcaneus, and talus, and it resists eversion of the foot. This one's not as often affected unless if it's a very serious um, sprain of an ankle. Um, it is typically also relatively considered stronger um, than the other ligaments here. And then on the lateral portion of the ankle to resist inversion, we have our anterior and posterior talofibular ligaments, our ATF, and anterior posterior cal calcaneofibular ligaments. These uh, ligaments are considered weaker than the deltoid, so you're more likely to have an inversion sprain than an eversion sprain. Right, awesome. We flew through that one Fast. I know I was like flying. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to pull up the picture of that, um, that space. I think it was Danielle, you asked me that question. So we can look at that space together as a group. And then we'll take our 10 minute break. While I'm pulling this up, any other questions or things that come to mind when you're looking at 
an image or a PowerPoint like this and like figuring out how to study it. What's, uh, Dr. What Kresha, I had one more question. Yeah. Um, we can wait till after Danielle's question too, but could you just explain the Tom, Dick and Harry again when you have a moment? Yes, absolutely. Yes. I will pull up, I'm going to go, we'll look at this um, region here and then we will look at Tom, Dick and Harry. Let me just get to our image. Oh, you know what? It might be in my abdominal. That's why. I think I have it in my abdominal presentation. All right. Let us get into it. There we go. Inguinal canal. Okay, so I'm going to share this first. Um, so trigger warning, this will obviously show like images of digitized genitalia. So if that will be triggering, then obviously keep that in mind. All right, let me share the screen. Let me go here, slideshow, current slides. Okay, great. So looking in this space, just to orient us to this inguinal region, um, inguinal area in general is the area extending between our anterior superior iliac spine and our pubic tubercle. Um, it's the region where structures will exit and enter into the abdominal cavity. Hernias occur here in both sexes, but they occur more in males because of this passage of the spermatic cord through the canal. And we'll look at a few pictures that will display that. Um, we also see that migration of testes from for the abdomen into the perineum accounts for many of the structural features of this region. So just to get us oriented before we look at all of the structures together, this is just showing a herniated loop of intestine coming through a defective inguinal canal on this side. This is our abdomen, this is our abdominal wall. This is the inguinal canal when it looks normal with our spermatic cord going down to the scrotum. Um, again, an orientation, weak area in the fascia, intestine protruding, protruding, protruding into the inguinal canal. Um, scrotum down here, pubic bone here, abdominal wall here. So this is our inguinal area. But then looking actually at the um, inguinal ligament and the iliopubic tract and comparing that to our image before where we were talking about our artery, our vein, our lymphatics in that space, we can kind of see this here. So this is an anterior inferior view. So we've like sliced the person across and we're looking downward versus this is looking um, more classically like straight on at a person. So looking at our inguinal ligament and this pubic tract, our inguinal ligament is the inferior most part of our external oblique aponeurosis. And it goes along with our iliopubic tract, which is the thickened portion of fascia that runs from our ASIS to the pubic tubercle, that gives a couple fibers to attach to our superior pubic rami and they form the lacunar ligament and they'll continue to kind of run. So what am I talking about here? Aponeurisis of external oblique, our abdominal muscle, ASIS here. Inguinal ligament is this green running across. Pectinal ligament is this ligament running behind. But this ignal, inguinal ligament is forming that top portion, remember, of that triangle, that femoral triangle that we were looking at before. So looking then at this picture, we can see our inguinal ligament running across here. We can see some of these muscles that have been cut. This is our um, pectineus muscle. This muscle here is our iliacus muscles. So these have been chopped because we're looking at this like straight down. And then if we look, we can see our femoral artery, our femoral vein, and our femoral canal, that space that we mentioned. And this is our femoral nerve all the way over here. So nerve, artery, vein, space. And then we have our, our lymphatics. Um, and this is kind of putting into perspective then where now we see this superficial inguinal ring that's lying almost on top over these structures in this triangular space. Um, and we can see where the inguinal ligament is kind of paying attention to or, or related to here. So then if we look at a different viewpoint, this is more of a classic anterior viewpoint of this anterior canal. We can see that we're going um, from I guess, deep to superficial. So we have these like layers of muscle that we've cut through. We can see where these artery and venous structures are running through that femoral canal. So we have our femoral artery vein, we have the nerve here, space, and then we'd have our um, lymphatics kind of in this region. 
all running through this triangle that's bordered by our inguinal ligaments. And on this medial aspect is where we have our actual inguinal canal with our actual spermatic cord running through. So our superficial inguinal ring located here. Um, we can see like origin of the cremasteric wrestle, muscle and internally, we can see this internal spermatic fascia and the inguinal ligament located here. I was gonna see if we could see the deep ring. Oh yeah, we can. We can see here through this picture, the deep ring, deep inguinal ring that's occurring as well. So we have our superficial inguinal ring, our deep inguinal ring. You can see the canal where these arteries and veins are flowing through, where we see our femoral artery and vein down here in the, in the femoral triangle. But so we can start to kind of see how this compression or how this issue could work if we had a actual hernia in this space and how that could potentially affect or compress or um, create issues with these different vessels and vasculature. Piecing it out here, if we actually um, break it down and look at a gross picture, gross anatomical picture or our digitized pictures here, we can see spermatic cord. Uh, we can see our inguinal ligaments, our lacunar ligaments, and then up here, this is our showing kind of everything cut away so we can reveal our deep inguinal ring. This probe is referring to the superficial inguinal ring and the spermatic cord can be seen exiting this ring. Um, the internal ring can be thought of the area as that the cord leaves the abdomen. The superficial ring is when the cord leaves the fascia. So that's kind of how we can keep those two things in mind. And then here's our triangle. Triangle is important. It's a classic board question. I think this is what Danielle asked. So I hope Danielle's back on the call. It's kind of waiting for her to get back on. Yes, you are. Yes, okay, I'm great. back. Awesome. Thank Good. You. I was I was like kind of feeling in space until you got back in. So Hesselbach's triangle is defined as the lateral border of the rectus abdominis, the inferior portion of the inguinal ligament, and all of the super important epigastric vessels. And why are they important? Because direct inguinal hernias occur directly medial to the epigastric vessels and indirect hernias occur directly lateral to the epigastric vessels. So this is our epigastric arteries. These are the vessels we're talking about here. This is our deep inguinal ring. And so a direct inguinal hernia is going to occur medially to these vessels. A indirect hernia is it gonna occur laterally to these vessels. So lateral, Medial would be over here, lateral being over here. Does that help give some perspective, Danielle? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Indirect hernias are more common. Um, and uh, there's other kind of hernias here. You can have both technically at the same time, but indirect would be more common. So it's going to be more common to have a hernia lateral to the epigastric vessels. An incarcerated hernia cannot be reduced or pushed back in. So if it is incarcerated, it's pushed out. You can't push it back in. Um, you could have necrosis then of the tissue loss of because of loss of blood supply. And that could lead to a position that's incompatible with life. And then that's different than we're talking inguinal here. You can also have a femoral hernia down in the femoral triangle. The inguinal is much more common. And then these are the other hernias and other kind of locations that you could see. So femoral, femoral canal, that femoral triangle, inguinal, inguinal canal. When you're dealing with Hesselbach's triangle, you're dealing with the inguinal canal versus femoral triangle. You're dealing with the femoral canal, but they interrelate via how these vasculature pieces flow through these spaces and eventually will come out as your femoral artery and vein. Okay. Awesome. All right. So that's that piece to kind of connect those two sections. Then I had the Tom, Dick and Harry question again, which is awesome. Love, love a good Tom, Dick and Harry question. Um, so our tendons of the flexor hallucis longus muscle. So our flexor hallucis longus muscle is this one. Our um, digitorum longus muscle, right? Yep. Flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, and then the tibialis posterior. So all three of these muscles here, their tendons are going to wrap around that medial malleolus, which we can see in this image here. The order that they wrap is often associated with um, questions about injury or cuts or compression or those type of pieces. 
So the medial malleolus is located here. The first tendon that's closest to the medial malleolus running posteriorly is going to be the tibialis posterior, which represents Tom. The second will be the flexor digitorum longus, which represents Dick. And then the last one or the one furthest away will be flexor hallucis longus, which represents Harry. All three of these tendons are kind of joining together from these posterior, um, essentially posterior deep muscle group. And they're moving behind the medial malleolus and then they have their attachment points in the foot. So questions about an ankle sprain, an E version ankle sprain potentially um, could be asked about like what tendon could be affected or a fracture or something like that. Does that help answer that question? Yes, thank you so much. Of course, absolutely. Okay. Jenny, are you able to hear my sound now? Yeah, I'm able to hear you. I just have to turn it like super high. Okay. I can try to like speak more into my microphone. All right. So let's take a let's take a ten. I'm gonna stop recording. When we come back, we're leaving MSK for good. Um, and we're going to go into uh, the wonderful world of the cardiovascular system and talk about the actual heart itself and its structures, and then talk about some vascular components coming off of it. And then we'll take a lunch. So we'll come back at 10 after. Um, so, or I guess like 11.09, 11.10, and then we'll get started with our cardiovascular discussion. So I'm going to stop the recording, get away from